Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is April 16, year 2023, 4.30 p.m. PDT. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. Seems like we have a pretty good group already in the live chat, but if you're joining us later, I'm sure you'll be richly rewarded. Now, who's this avant-garde looking guy on the thumbnail for this particular talk? Well, that's Ezra Pound. And it might not be a name that you're familiar with unless you're an English major. And even then, it uh, might be possible that uh, your professors left him off the curriculum. And um, that's all the more reason for us to investigate. There's a reason why he's been sort of blocked out of the literary history. Nonetheless, there was a recent book, and by recent, I mean, let's see, 2017, I would count that as recent, a recent book by a British literary historian. I think that's a decent characterization. His name's uh, Daniel Swift. He's a professor. Uh, what is, a, is a, his affiliation here? Let's see. The College of Humanities, London, or New College of Humanities, London, which I don't know much about. But um, anyway, he is British, and I think it's important because he's coming at Ezra Pound from a, uh, a certain perspective that's predictably not going to be very flattering. Because Ezra Pound was one amongst the first modern and by that, I mean, he was born way back in 1872, or not 72. He was uh, an Edwardian gentleman. He was born in the, in, in the previous century, all right? He died in 1972. Uh, his look is very 2023, and I think a lot of younger poets, uh, writers, people are interested in the beats, for example. For those people who are into the beat fad for a while, um, William Burroughs and uh, uh, Allen Ginsberg and that whole crew. There was a big fad, I don't know, about 10, 15 years ago. I think it's a natural progression for you to go even earlier back and check out Ezra Pound because, man, he was a beat before the beats were the beats. And uh, he was very much for real. And, um, in fact, the beat movement would not have been possible had it not been for Ezra Pound and people within his circle, people such as Ernest Hemingway, T.S. Eliot, um, e. e. Cummings, James Joyce. All right, these these are some of the the more prominent figures, and they're lesser. I don't mean less important, but lesser names that we might not know. Uh, they were very much influenced by Ezra Pound. And then, of course, there are contemporary poets. I call them the academic poets because prior to, I think, the 1950s, it was very rare to see anybody teaching uh, poetry specifically. And people like Charles Olson, which was, a, was news to me, he figures prominently in the life of Ezra Pound, Charles Olson, which I didn't know until reading this book. Um, he's, he's an academic poet. Most of these people wound up in academia. And, um, of course, their creativity was uh, either stifled or, or died out uh, um, entirely. Uh, people of, of this ilk, um, John Barron and um, the uh, post-war poets were very much influenced by Ezra Pound, which makes it all the more puzzling why he he is not really taught anymore in the English department, except by maybe one allotted specialist. There's this Shakespeare guy or gal. There's the guy that does Dickens. And maybe there's a person that does, that does modernist poet poetry in, in Ezra Pound, maybe specifically. And the reason for this, I believe, is because not because of his poetry, not because of his aesthetics. He was a cultural critic. He wrote several books on American, um, not just elite, um, but Euro-American and European, particularly Southern European, since he lived in Italy for, I think, 20, 25 years, possibly 30 years. Most of his adult life, he lived in 
in Italy. And I mentioned that because this is what got him in trouble when the United States was lured into the second World Bankers War, World War II, as it were called. But the Bankers War, which he called out, I'm talking about Ezra Pound, called out and named who's in who, who's who was who, and also tracing them back to their earlier war, World War One. And uh, he was in his majority when, when um, World War One took place. A lot of his friends were killed. Um, people like um, uh, Hemingway, of course, famously were involved with the uh, on, on the battlefield of the Spanish American War, reporting World War One. Uh, th these were the, uh, the the writers of action, as opposed to the academic um, uh, namby pambies who did G GLBTQ theory from the comfort of their air conditioned nightmarish office. Uh, these these were men who were fighting fascism, uh, including Ezra Pound. And I say that counterintuitively because when you hear, if you've heard of Ezra Pound, you immediately you've been trained. It's a dog whistle effect. You've been trained to associate him with, oh, fascism, Ezra Pound. <clears throat> and in fact, that happened to me when I was introduced to Ezra Pound in college. He was still alive when I was a freshman in college, but he was in his uh, dying days. Um, he died, like, like I said, in 72. But when I um, took a course in um, Asian religion, which was really big back then, it was post-60s and all things Asian and Buddhism and Zen, you know, we're talking about Allen Ginsberg and all the pop Buddhists and the whole pop culture started to move into the occult, Hinduism. This is when, um, you know, the Beatles went on the, their pilgrimage. And this is when um, uh, paganism really started to undergo its, its contemporary revival. And we're still in the midst of this, right? Ezra Pound didn't uh, address the plague of paganism as such, but he did talk about Moloch, and he talked about the, the occultic origins of what he called usuria or usury, right? And that's what got him in trouble because, again, one of those dog whistle terms like Ezra Pound, fascism, usury. When you hear usury, you hear Jew, right? We, we've been conditioned to that. Even though, the, as we know, the, the banking system was not created by Jews. They were kind of slotted into that position, that middleman position that allowed certain families, most, you know, but the Rothschilds. And by the way, by calling out the Rothschilds, this was his... Um, his death warrant, really. He wasn't killed. They were trying, uh, they mean the establishment were trying to indict him. Well, he was indicted for treason against the United States of America, but they weren't able to execute him. Such was his prominence, his cultural prominence, not just in America, but in Britain, in Eng English speaking world, and uh, th throughout the world, really. He was an internationally prominent figure. So, to put him into that bag would not only have been incorrect, but it would have been a really bad move on the part of um, uh, the U.S. government. So they did the second best thing. They put him in the bug house, the nut house, the loony bin for about 12 years or so. And it's St. Elizabeth's, no apostrophe, St. Elizabeth's. And from what I understand, it was founded by one of these uh, spiritualist inflected do-gooders, Dorothea Dix. Remember, I've been talking, and I'm going to get back to this. In fact, I should clear this up before I even get into Ezra Pound. I, I should go back and tell you uh, some follow-up discoveries. But Dorothea Dix is credited with founding a humane, insane asylum. Sounds like a contradiction in terms, and, and it is. And I mention this is because Ezra Pound was really one of the first political dissidents who was subjected to psychiatry as a form of political dis uh, discipline, right? We, we know a little bit of what was going on in the Soviet Union in parallel. They used psychiatry as a way to silence 
political dissidents, but th there was a parallel movement going on in uh, in the United States and, and, and certainly in Britain and in other countries. France, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. There was a, a more of a um, humanistic streak that was that was retained. Um, they didn't swallow whole hog the um, the uh, Freudian uh, perspective and the institutional bedlam, right? Short for Bethlehem model of uh, taking care of uh, what Foucault later wrote about ex extensively about about the uh, crazy people in society, and many of them were crazy on as defined by their heterodox ideology. And he challenged the globalist banking establishment at the outset. And so another reason why I'm talking about as a pound today is because, as you know, I've been trying to, because I didn't realize how, how the current generation of truth seekers, and I mean that in a positive term, even though it's used disparagingly sometimes, uh, the current gen younger generation of truth seekers is oblivious to the forefathers and the foremothers of this line of inquiry. And it's important, not just historically, but it's important because we're not, uh, it, it prevents us from falling from the flack masters and mistresses that have been put out there, a whole new generation of flack meisters who are supported by wealthy mommies and daddies who bought them YouTube channels or publishing companies who are not only plagiarizing Ezra Pound and his chief most productive disciple, Ezra as Eustace Mullins, who I'll talk about in a moment. I'm going to talk about Ezra Pound and I'm going to talk about Eustace Mullins. He's another person who is rapidly fading from memory, even though he died not that long ago. I think it was. I don't want to get the date wrong, but um, he certainly died by the time I was well into this field of what used to be called alternative research. Now it's called ent entertainment research, right? You've got all these different channels that present this rehashed, warmed over, denatured material as original. And it's mainly for distraction purposes and um even though they may might be sincere, but it's mostly so to keep us in a state of of fear, of chaos, of uncertainty, and of um, this this social psychology of um, catastrophism, which I'm going to critique. It's become a social psychology uh, in the United States and and perhaps the world over because people. Um, all over the planet now it can through the internet can watch you know the alex jones show or i just mentioned him because he's sort of like the the umbrella term for the dozens if not scores of channels now that have captured the imagination of those who speak and understand english right and so i'm, I'm doing this talk for you to to understand that that this whole line of inquiry and that entertainment has been hijacked Right. Um, just like social movements that start organically from the grassroots, right, like the green movement, right, the uh, environmental movement started from uh, grassroots concern about what's happening to our farmlands and wetlands and whatnot. And by hopefully by now, you know, most of these so-called environmental groups, Greenpeace, all the way down the line, that's just one name out of many that comes to mind, um, have hijacked that movement. So wouldn't it make sense if, for those of you who, who don't want to believe me, wouldn't it make sense that this whole field of conspiratainment has similarly been hijacked and body snatched and swapped out with younger figures? And I'm not against youth. If you're for the truth, I don't care if you're youth. It's okay with me. It's fine. I, in fact, uh, um, it's highly uh, important that you get involved, but it's also important that you not be deceived by some of these people that you you want to emulate because um, all of a sudden they're you know, rocking 500,000 subscribers out of nowhere. Excuse me for a moment. 
I've been writing more, more than lecturing or talking or speaking. So my vocal cords um, um, start to um, weaken from, from disuse. But uh, a little bit of tea I found out and a little bit of warmth so it helps loosen them up as I get into my talk here. Um, anyway, let me uh, go through some, as I alluded to earlier, let me revisit a discovery that those of you who watch me regularly check out my playlist, my suppressed playlist on TubeU. But if you've been following me recently when I'm talking about crazy women's, you know, and I've been chastised for that's like a sexist statement, crazy women's, and we can talk about crazy men's, but you know, I think there it's got to be even Stevens. You want a gender equality, we got to go both ways. So I think we, we need to talk about crazy women's right and so i talk about one crazy woman's and her name was phoebe apperson hurst and um she was the the widow woman of george hurst of course who was a big mining guy m-i-n-i-g you know gold silver copper all that that's where he made his nut and the wealth that he left phoebe apperson hurst was a was the nut for the University of California, which is really, as most of you know, if you've heard my earlier talks going back two years or more, is actually Skull and Bones East called the University of California. Right, because we know the New Englanders with their Yankee Clippers and their beautiful museums that have the plunder of the East, they still have the best East Asian art collections at Yale and Harvard and those places where the Yankee traders, euphemistically opium traders, right? The Dale and O's, you know that story. Uh, but they were in the East, right? So they needed a, um, a Western division. That's the University of California. So Hearst was one of their pass-throughs, George Hearst and the Hearst family. And they set up and they put one of their assets, Daniel Coit Gilman. I've talked about him extensively over the past several years. I've, so check him out. Coit, there's a Coit Tower in San Francisco. I think I think it's related to him. But I think he was the, I think he was number two, the second president of the University of California. I might be wrong. But he's a Midwestern boy. And he was um, into eugenics, all of it. All these guys were. And they're women's. The crazy ass women's were also heavily into eugenics. And that goes, that's counterintuitive to how we like to view women as Madonnas. Not Madonna Ciccone, but uh, Madonna as in, you know, the biblical Mad Madonna, right? And we, we, we hope we adore them, even though Phoebe Hearst would like to see my people, and she was she agitated to do so, to be kept out of the country. She hated Asians, she hated Orientals. She liked the religion, she just didn't like the people. Just like today, the people like the Asian women's and they like the Asian foods, but they just don't like the Asian peoples. You know, they wanna consume the women's, they wanna consume the cuisine, uh, but they hate the chat comms, right? So Apperson Hearst was an Orientalist. So was the woman counterpart, another crazy woman's down south and in Palo Alto, California, and the, in the the um, the farm, the affectionately known farm, as it's still known today, Stanford University, and that would be Jane Lathrop Stanford. She was also an Orientalist, and she was a spiritualist. So I'm going to talk. I don't want to take too much time away from Mr. Pond, so let me get to it real quickly, and I'll revisit it maybe later. But I'm telling you that. I'm on a string here, a thread that's very important to understanding why the university is promoting so-called neuroscience. In fact, they've got one of their Stanford guys who has a channel now free of charge, right? You're going to see more people like me coming from real universities who are real professors, both active and past, in order to negate me. Jordan Peterson was only the first one, but I'm not going away. All right, so you're going to see more people like me who are just like the new um, wave of pop-up pundits who are moving away, moving out the earlier ones, right? And uh, I'll talk about some of these new academic types who've been showing up lately as uh, limited hangouts or unlimited hangouts. But there's a, there's a guy in 
neuroscience from Stanford. And I, and I just noticed he came into my feed after I started talking about the occult origins of Stanford. And it's because of the occult origins of Stanford University that we're being jacked with today in 2023 by such Stanford affiliate pe people as the path pass through known as uh, Elon Musk oil. Right, he's the musk ox of the new world order. Um, so these are some crazy people, and and they we have to look at the metaphysical, the occultic origins. The, uh, there's a book, an excellent one. I was rereading it last night. It's called Satanic Feminism. I've cited it before. It's published by Oxford University Press. This is not some garbage uh, that that's somebody concocted, some pop up pundit concocted because Satanism is a a really good um, clickbait word, and so is feminism. You combine the two. This is Oxford University Press. So they're beginning to out themselves. In fact, just as a very, very quick digression, I, I will go back to this later. They're even publishing uh, histories of their own secret societies now that people like Ezra Pound and useless, I'm sorry, Eustace Simons, <laughs> Ezra Pound used to affectionately refer to his chief uh, devotee, Eustace Mullins, sometimes as useless Mullins. But they um, they, had, they had sort of a, a, you know, a troubled relationship, but it was a productive one. Uh, Ezra Pound was not the most, he's a genius. He was not very easy to get along with, uh, even um, with someone so devoted to him as Eustace Mullins. But here's a book that I came across. The Pilgrim Society and Public Diplomacy, 1895 to 1945. So they're beginning to publish their own work before uh, people like uh, uh, Eustace Mullins had to go to go to the Library of Congress and um, the D.C. area archives, National Archives, <clears throat> and private libraries to dig up this information and find find the lists of um, membership amongst a very limited 100. Uh, privately printed uh, guidebooks, sort of like Skull and Bones used to have a, a, an annual. And I guess it was Charlotte Issert B who lent the privately published uh, yearbooks to um, uh, our friend at the Hoover Institution, um, Anthony uh, Sutton, or Anthony Sutton. Uh, this information came in the hands of into the hands of people like Eustace. Mullins to the point where now they, these uh, books are beginning to appear. This is another academic book published by the University of Edinburgh. You want to talk about New World Order? You want to talk about Old World, world Order? You want to talk about uh, Knights Templar? You want to talk about Scottish, uh, Anglo-American um, relationship, British, Scottish relationship? You want to talk about Scotland and, and the attempted overtaking of Japan or Japan, the Japans? Unfortunately, they, they ran into a superior civilization who were armed to the teeth and had 250 years of internecine war under their belt to repulse the Templars that came to take it over. And before them, the Jesuits, who tried to take them over ideologically. So we're talking about a global system here. And by the way, one another reason why Ezra Pound was pounded on uh, especially in the post-war Cold War establishment, because he dared take China seriously as a civilization. In fact, as I told you before, my introduction to Ezra Pound was in a course on Asian religions. This was in 71, 72, around the time that he died, right? And um, one of the required readings was the Analects of, Confu of, of Confucius, you know, and like you and me, I'm a third generation America, so I had to watch the same bullshit you did on the movies and the reruns and the Saturday show about Charlie Chan and about Confucius Say and about Fortune Cookie and about the Chai Coms today. Right? I was socialized into that. I was socialized into that regime of mind control to the point that I later wrote a book about Asian Americans on TV called Monitored Peril. I made it into my career. You understand? That's that's how you attack these problems. You don't just sh shake them off and hope they'll go away. You attack them. And these New World Order handlers were interested enough 
in what I had to say to hire me and take me into their bowels at the University of California, Davis, based on my scholarship that was challenging their regime. I guess their thought was it's better to keep your enemies close to you. We'll just give them a little token job here as a token hop seeing of the, of the Bonanza Ponderosa Ranch. And he'll just shut up and, and do his little Chinaman, his Japanese houseboy, his Japanese gardener act for us. That's what they thought. This I'm just trying to project what was going on, but they were wrong. And it's due to work, uh, people like Eustace Mullins, who are telling the truth, that now the establishment themselves is coming forth with it. And I think getting to this book proper, and that's one of the reasons why I think Daniel Swift came out with this book recently is because no matter how they try to suppress Ezra Pound by locking up in the bug house, we know it is a nut house, right? For for 12 years, 13 years, some according to some accounts. Um, and trying to defame Eustace Mullins, which I'll talk, I'll read extensively a whole passage that Swift devotes to, to Mullins to try to defame him. And I'm going to do this in the attempt to encourage you, if you haven't already, many of my viewers are already there. So I apologize if you already know this and you've seen all the videos that you can find on YouTube on um, Eustace Mullins in particular. And all his books are still available. Uh, they are usually in zip files and they're on PDFs. I have some excerpts that I've um, shared with you on my Patreon. Uh, so he's not going to go away. So they decided uh, to get a literary critic uh, to see what, what, what he could do to eviscerate the memory of Ezra Pound and the contribution, not just the memory of Ezra Pound and uh, Eustace Mullins. But anyway, I'm trying to, let me finish up with Apperson Hearst and um, uh, Lathrop Stanford, the two crazy women's, right? The two major research institutions and their origins in occultism, more specifically spiritualism or spiritism. One of the offshoots of that or manifestations of that is theosophy, which is alive and well. And it's that's why I've done the talks on Santa Barbara. And that's when I started getting... Um, put on the bench, getting strikes from two of you, especially when I talked about the uh, reality show starring Harry and Meghan, right? And the Institute for Democratic Institutions, Santa Barbara, tied it in with the California. All right, there's a whole trajectory that me, that Professor Hamamoto channel can be found, right? These are not just one-offs and they're not just random, they are connected. And um, these are all people that have been on my radar for many, many years. And now I have the opportunity, the luxury of really studying their own work closely. The two books that I talked about last time on Lathrop, Stanford, Jane, are academic books written by people from the academic establishment. And in one of the books, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to revisit this, because I don't think it was fully recognized because of my error with the audio. By the way, I'm looking in the discussion. Is my audio working? I don't see any problems with... Uh... Okay, yeah, I guess I'm coming through all right. And I can see here that I'm not muted. But it's because of the problems I had with, with the muted first version, which ironically had more views than the second version because I immediately went back into the saddle and I redid it. And I think the second version was better. But the second version goes into more explicit detail in the fact that um, Jane Lathrop Stanford and Leland Stanford were engaged, and this is 1868. And this isn't from an academic book. This is not from some conspiratainment site, right? This is from a guy who was on medical school faculty from Stanford university itself all right i brought the book i didn't know i filed it away i showed it to you but the point is is that leland he was a railroad baron right head of the uh union pacific railroad that terminated here in sacramento that connected the transcontinental railroad we all learned this in school 
in American history. That's Leland Stanford. When you talk about railroads, you're talking about J.P. Morgan. When you're talking about J.P. Morgan. You're talking about the Rothschild. And that's Rothschild, right? And the railroad monopoly. They owned almost all of it, like 99% of it. And Stanford was one of their boys. And with some of the money, they started the occult university. And I stopped me saying, now, this is their idea. They were going to start a university built on principles of spiritualism, talking to the dead, rapping. I told you in, in the latter part of the 19th century is a product of the Second Great Awakening that the upper middle class and the bourgeoisie, which are almost entirely white and almost entirely Protestant, were heavily involved in spiritism, which is a euphemism for Luciferianism. I don't know if I stress that strongly enough. Luciferianism. And you know what that is, right? You know what? why Lucifer was cast out of heaven? Because he wanted to be as God. And isn't that what a lot of so-called neuroscience is doing? Because psychiatry has been pretty much discredited by any number of psychiatrists themselves, right? Like Dr. Uh, Thomas Zas, Dr. Peter Bregan, who I think is still practicing psychiatry, and all kinds of people, right? So it's, oh, well, we're going to rebrand it. We're going to call it neuroscience. And, and I'm telling you this because I'm reading a lot of literature on that's promoting it. Maybe that's another talk. I've been reading extensively this week and, you know, alongside this material here. And it's germane because what did they try to do to Ezra Pound? They tried to, they didn't try to, they did incarcerate him for a dozen years. And they stigmatized him with, with that of being a nutcase and a fascist and an anti-Semite. Oh, that's the hat trick right there. That's the trifecta. How are you ever going to dig yourself out of a hole like that? So this is the challenge today that I am going to undertake. Uh, let's talk about Phoebe Hurst. Oh, I'm sorry. Again, I have to apologize. There's one other tidbit I have to share with you about Phoebe Aberson Hurst. Remember, I mentioned, go back if you don't remember, that she was a devotee of Abdul Baha, and she met him. She went to what was then Persia, was the protector. It was under British control back then. This is all Anglo-American operation. We're talking about anyway, right? Skull and Bones, University of California, Stanford, um, Rothschild, J.P. Morgan. She went to go visit this prophet named Abdul Baha, who out of after which the religion Baha religion was named which, as I told you before, is the fastest growing religion today. And when I started reason, reading her connection with it, I already suspected, oh, this is a this is a British intelligence operation, British slash uh, Israeli. And this was before the formation of the state of Rothschild Israeli, right? That wasn't formed until later, right? But the British were getting set up to other uh, Rothschild, which means you know British slash Rosa, were getting set up th uh, their own synthetic state called um, Israel uh, today, right? And you know all the mythology and the backstory of that and Zionism and um, whatnot, political Zionism as well as religious Zionism. Uh, that's the nature, the quality of of my viewership. They're not. That they're not newbies. So she went there and, and she even had him. He came on a tour of the U.S. to visit a lot of crazy old other, very wealthy. They're white. I'm going to say they're white women's because colored women's weren't involved with this. We're talking about a racial, heavily racially segment, uh, segregated society. So I'm talking about crazy ass white women's. And I'm saying there's a lot of them running around in 2023. Now they're calling themselves ufologist or new age or whatever, right? But you can't say that because you're a sexist and you're a racist if you do say that. But they're, they are the lineal descendants of Jane Lathrop Stanford and Phoebe Apperson Hurst. They were totally into women's education, co-education, which I'm, I am for as well. I am for gender equality. If you haven't figured that out, all right. Gender, um, religious, ethnic equality. You know, equality as it's enshrined in the U.S. Bill of Rights, right? 
And they were right. Both these women supported women in higher education because they were men folk. Many of them were trying to suppress it. And one of the innovations of, of what became Stanford University is that they, from the outset, wanted to admit women on an equal basis as men's. All right. So don't get don't get it twisted now. When I when I go into this rhetoric to get you all riled up, because I do want to kind of mix it up here and, and and get you excited so that you'll you'll dig into it deeply. But let me just finish it up here. So I found out the connection, which I didn't know until I read her bi biography, Phoebe Appleson Hurst, that she was Baha'i. And then I was reading just serendipitous, right? Just happenstance. This is what happens when you, you've, you've experienced this, the, the eureka moment, the aha. This, you're reading something seemingly utterly different. I was reading some site. I'm not going to give you the name of the site or the person who authored the article because um, to me, he's he's not fully credible in my eyes either. But even in those sites, there's some information there that's useful and it's worth checking out. But anyway, on this side, I read, was reading an entire article devoted to, hey, am I ever going to get to Ezra Pound? I might have to save that for another talk. But there was an entire article devoted to, to Dr. Stephen Greer. Okay, he's a medical doctor. You know his story. And I mention this because everybody here in the chat room has seen him. He's the guy that wears the tight um, <clears throat> polo shirts, you know, with the high cuffs here so he can show his guns. And he's an EMT guy. And he can bench press 400 pounds. He can kick your ass. He's no wimpy uh, sort of living room uh, ufologist. He's, he's heading a disclosure movement. That's Stephen Greer, right? And if you've seen my earlier talks, I've gone through any number of these people's works and try to vet it on air for veracity, believability, factuality, and also trying to raise or examine the question of whether if it's a PSYOP or not, truth, diversion. And by the way, I have a, a, a posting on my Patreon. You can see that full link to the article that I mentioned. And you can read it with all the links within it. And you can also get an excerpt of the book that I was able to confirm from his own writing, Dr. Stephen Greer. It's called Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, published in 2006. By the way, it's going used um, on Amazon for, I think, something like $100. A lot of these books are going away. The physical copies, they're going to Kindle so they can kindle it later if it becomes inconvenient to have it around so so buy the buy these books when you can you know hard copies all my favorite authors kirby summers um michael uh his book's still in print miraculously people that i've talked about in an interview before buy buy their books in hard hardcover if you can because they're going to go away just like the um, paper it's fake anyway the paper currency is going away the, I'm not panicking about that by the way maybe, maybe it's for the better that um, we we go through this incredible uh, economic uh, crisis uh, this whole system is is coming to an end and the reason I'm mentioning is because guess who was talking about it and delineating the structure and the names involved with this banking system. It was Ezra Pound. See how it comes full circle again? Anyway, let me finish with what Dr. Stephen Greer. As it turns out, this, this one site that was talking smack about him mentioned that he was Baha'i. I said, oh, that, that rings a bell. I was following Phoebe Hearst on Baha'i. So I said, I'm not going to take his word. I'm going to look at Greer's book himself. And he talks about being in Israel, living in Israel, for two or three years. And I think Baha'i is probably a um, Israeli intelligence front today. The, the current, maybe originally when Abdul Baha was alive, it was organic, right? But today, you you know, you know about Operation Chaos and cults and, and religion, fake religions and fronts. You know about um, Vatican, post-Vatican II. And, and this, this guy goes in on everybody. So he said he's Baha'i. And so I looked at his own book and he talks about his his whole uh, adventure in Israel vis and visiting the, the gravesite of um, Abdu'l-Baha and being Baha'i. 
which is the fastest growing religion today in 2023. So if nothing else, just keep that in the back of your mind. If you start hearing Baha'i, 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 and if you start seeing them taking the place that was vacated by Scientology, which was another synthetic cult that a lot of celebs finally came out and it, a lot of people aren't feeling very good about being attached to it. But so let's move over to Baha'i. Right? There's Nixium and all this. And um, again, Kirby Summers had a really good series on the, the there were women's, there were these crazy ass women's behind Nixium. It wasn't Keith. Well, Keith Rainier was a very smart con man, but the, the women who were doing all this was women's. Okay, in 2020, 20, whatever, you know, recently. Okay, and they had wealth, they had money, they had resources. I don't have it. You don't have it. If, whether you're a woman's or a men's, you don't have that wealth, you don't have that power to create these synthetic cults. So anyway, that's uh, Dr. Stephen Greer. It's in his own words. I don't like to go on hearsay. I go into their own work and now you can better evaluate i think the so-called disclosure movement which i've always held in not in high regard but in, in in a very skeptical fashion and they're on all the show i mean it's just like i said it's become entertainment it's distraction um and <laughs> you know that i'm preaching to the choir you you know, the people who are watching this and watch it later know this, but for, for some of the people who come in later and watch the show after it's in the can, so to speak, and, and they're pissed off because I'm criticizing, you know, so-and-so and so and their favorite person who's imprinted their person on, you know, they're going to be pissed off as hell, but but they might be motivated to start reevaluating who these people that they hold up as heroes, and then we'll be better able to pursue the true miscreants behind the system. I think Ezra Pound and Ezra and uh, Eustace Mullins got it right for the most part. With the knowledge, the information that they had at their disposal, they they got it right for the most part, right? The particulars might differ. And I say that because there's all these nit, these nitpickers. Oh, well, he got this wrong. So the whole framework's been discredited, right? Those are your nitpickers. But overall, Pound figured it out. Okay, so finally, we're going to get into it. Uh, I was able to acquire this book thanks to my Patreon supporters. Um, and for those, in fact, I, what I should, I've been just name checking Ezra Pound with, without really explaining who he is. But I'm going to let one of these uh, biographies do some of the explaining or splaining as Ricky Ricardo used to do. You've got a lot of splaining to do, Lucy. Right? So I'm going to let the uh, two of you do some splaining, even though I'll probably, well, hopefully I don't get a copyright strike. I'm going to show a little bit of it. Ezra Pound, and you check it out on your own. There's tons of material out there. I encourage you to read it. You'll find him a fashion. I think he's, for any of you who, wanna, who have access to capital, want to make money, Make a feature film on Ezra Pound. All all the uh, post millennials, all the hipsters, all the cool people who are who want to be poets and musicians and spoken word artists and uh, you know your alternative or you you want to be, you know you're you're at the Rhode Island School of Design or you're in the art department or you're in performance studies. Check out Ezra Pound. He's the next big thing. Professor Hamamoto is predicting it. There's going to be a huge Ezra Pound revival. So get on top of it. Uh, I mean, look at his pick. He looks like he's something like right out of 2023 avant-garde. Yeah. <laughs> As a poet, translator, critic, and essayist, Ezra Pound exerted a profound influence on English literature in the 20th century. A voracious reader, his work teems with allusions and references to authors who captured his attention. Because of his political activities and socio-economic theories, Pound still generates controversy. In both his own work and through advancing the work of others he admired, Pound represents a seminal moment in defining the modernist aesthetic. With such a vast and eclectic legacy, 
Ezra Pound is a literary figure who defies easy classification. He received a scholarship to carry out research in Spain on the playwright Lope de Vega. In 1907, he came back to the States to take a job teaching Romance languages at Wabash College in Indiana. His stint as a teacher lasted barely four months. Pound found himself deeply at odds with American educational institutions. He felt that when it came to art, they were simply getting it all wrong. You cannot give a recipe for composing a Mozartian melody. We should not ask an art teacher a recipe for making a drawing like Leonardo da Vinci. This is the reason for the extreme boredom produced by the current professorial documentation. The great experts often ignore the stupidity of the pedagogical routine. <laughs> See if I can in 1908, Pound traveled to Venice as a journalist, bringing with him During the 20s, okay, in his this poetry. Is, this is where Pound got in, in trouble with, with the, the international banking cartel. He started writing about political economics in addition to his poetry and... Uh, mentoring people like uh, T.S. Eliot. I think, uh, uh, yeah, the, the Wasteland, which everybody has read, right, and if you went to high school or college, uh, was dedicated to Ezra Pound because he he had a, a very strong hand in editing. I think he chopped it in half and, and made it readable. So this, but this is where he got in trouble. And then, then we'll move into uh, um, Eustace Mullins. With Uzura hath no manner house of good stone, each block cut smooth and well fitting, that design might cover their face. With Uzura hath composed several essays on economics and politics, in which he restated the views he had expressed in his poems. Credit is a social product. It does not depend on the individual alone. The trust you have in me paying you back a hundred liras in ten years is based on the social order, the degree of civilization, the probabilities and possibilities of human conglomeration. In 1933, Pound published the book ABC of Economics with the aim of spreading his doctrine of social credit, a new economy that was free of usury. Pound's innovation and experimentation in poetry and criticism had always generated strong feelings from his colleagues and readers, but nothing prepared him for the chorus of censure that was to greet his political activities. In 1939, Pound returned to the United States he wanted to meet with Franklin Roosevelt and suggest to him a new direction for the American economy. The meeting never took place. By the time he returned to Italy, Germany had already launched its military strike against Poland. The Second World War had begun. Naively believing that their political philosophies would put into practice his economic ideals, Pound expressed sympathy for Italy and Germany's position and became an adherent of Mussolini's fascist movement. Pound agreed with anti-Semites who believed that the economic system was being exploited by Jewish financiers. In early 1941, he began broadcasting propaganda supporting Italian fascism and German Nazism from Radio Roma. He continued these broadcasts even after the United States entered the war in 1941.
Okay, that gives you some of the, an idea of what uh, what got Ezra Pound into hot water. Uh, Mussolini fell from power in uh, 1943, I believe, and uh, Pound was was in Italy when um, the uh, Allied troops came in, American troops in specific, and found him, apprehended him, and um, there was a warrant out because he had been indicted for treason because as that little clip showed you, he, uh, P Pound, went on the Italian radio on the behalf of the culture, the Ministry of Culture under the Mussolini regime and talked about the banker's war and talked about the utter insanity of of the United States going to war against Italy or Germany when, when the real problem was in the city of London. And of course, that's why this guy had to write the book. He teaches in London and he's, he's a British subject. And this is a more genteel liter literary historical contemporary way of undermining the truths of Ezra Pound and by extension, uh, Eustace Mullins. All right. So I'm, I'm really truncating the history. It's fascinating. And I told you it would make an incredible biopic. I would nominate Christopher Walken, not Christopher Walken, um, uh, although he, he he has sort of um, pound poundian types of characteristics. Um, God, what's his name? He's he's a really good actor, but he's pretty much been blacklisted because of his um, poundian type beliefs that he dared utter on on Twitter. What's his name? Um, well, it, it'll come to me anyway. There, there are certain um, actors um, who are in play right now, American actors who would make a really good uh, pound of figure in, in, a, in a really decent biopic, which I volunteer to uh, write or to consult with. Uh, it has, there are so many dramatic points that, that, that are involved here. So let's talk a little bit briefly. Again, find out more on your own about the relationship with Eustace Mullins. He was introduced, uh, Mullins was introduced to Pound, I think through his wife. They were living in the DC area. St. Elizabeth is in the DC area. I think it's in the state of Maryland, but it's in that that area. And um, um, they hit it off and uh, Ezra Pound, to make a long story short, gave, um, Eustace Mullins, a stipend of $10 a week to do research for Ezra Pound at the Library of Congress and National Archives and other libraries, private and public, in that area on the U.S. Federal Reserve. And it's that research, here's the takeaway point here, it's that research compiled by Mullins, sponsored by Ezra Pound, that went into his own uh, writing and had informed his earlier uh, radio broadcasts when he was in Italy and uh, accused of treason. That is the basis for most of the plagiarized work by the pundocracy today. That's that's the origins of it. It was done by Eustace Mullins. So it's uh, an insult to his, his um, industry and to his sacrifice. He wasn't thrown in prison himself, but he never made a huge killing as a writer like some of these other characters today or just you know popping up like um, toadstools after a, a rain, right? And um, like I say, these these books are still available on PDF if you want to look at them. Too numerous to list. To list at least two dozen of them, including one book on a very topical issue that will get me banned from Tube View if I dare mention the title. But just let's just say it has to do. And this was published years ago with what we just endured in the recent two and a half, three years. That was Eustace, Eustace Mullins who wrote that book. And believe me, I read it. So when it was rolled out, at least mentally, I was prepared for it emotionally. I'd say, okay, this is what Mullins was talking about early on. And I knew that it wasn't just a biomedical institutional NCA or NIH issue was a banking maneuver, a globalist banking maneuver. 
right? That has led us today in 2023. That's the reason why I'm talking about an old man, right? Who died back in 70. Oh, what, you know, he's old school. No, Yusuf Malin, he's dead. He's gone. No, no, no. They are both alive today in 2023, unless we re revisit their work. And it's highly readable, by the way, much more readable than some of these morons that are um, you know, writing or more like cut and pasting other material that they got on Wikipedia or, or um, from from YouTubing and, and, and searching, right? It's all rehashed, right? It's there for our our information and our rearmament, right? So here's a typical biography as I wind down here about Eustace Mullins. I'm going to play the whole deal, but don't be put off by it because that's what's going to show up first in the feed when you put in Eustace Mullins. And then I'll show you an excerpt of one of his original pieces done by someone who was there before Alex Jones. Alex Jones is rolled out because there was an organic group of younger people around his age in their 20s who were doing uh, local public access and radio shows. And they were coming from a variety of conservative uh, perspectives. So in order to control it, well, they let Alex Jones, right, do his thing for a while until they, they jerk the chain on him after Sandy Hook and then the other ones in the trial in the recent trial and all that. And now he's fully within that particular camp of controlled opposition. So we're going to see that after we first see the propagandist piece right here. Here we go. Are you ready? Eustace Mullins, the bogus version. Eustace Clarence Mullins Jr. was an American white supremacist, anti-Semitic <laughs> conspiracy theorist, propagandist, Holocaust denier, and writer. A disciple of the poet Ezra Pound, his best-known work is The Secrets of the Federal Reserve, in which he alleged that several high-profile bankers had conspired to write the Federal Reserve Act for their own nefarious purposes, and then induced Congress to enact it into law. The Southern Poverty Law Center described him as a one-man organization of hate. Letter from Eustace Mullins to J. Edgar Hoover, June 5, 1966 Eustace Clarence Mullins Jr. was born in Roanoke, Virginia, the third child of Eustace Clarence Mullins and his wife Jane Catherine Muse. His father was a salesman in a retail clothing store. He said he was educated at Ohio State University, New York University, and the University of North Dakota, although the FBI was unable to verify his attendance at any of them, with the exception of one summer session at NYU in 1947. In December 1942 he enlisted in the military as a warrant officer at Charlottesville, Virginia. He was a veteran of the United States Army Air Forces, serving 38 months during World War II. In 1949 Mullins worked at the Institute for Contemporary Arts in Washington, D.C. where he met Ezra Pound's wife Dorothy, who introduced him to her husband. Okay, this is where we get into the Ezra Pound, Eustace Mullins relationship. Uh, he himself uh, was interested in Pound because Eustace Mullins wanted to be a writer of fiction. So it turned out most of his career is devoted to nonfiction, right, research, unless, of course, you're with the Southern Poverty Law Center and you, you've automatically, rent, like all the bugaboos are there. He's an anti-Semite, he's a white supremacist and blah, blah. It's all there, man. I mean, it's, it's any college kid who reads that, oh, no, I have to, they're going to run out of, uh, away from the computer screaming. This is everything that my professor of sociology or my professor of women and gender studies told me that's, that it's been ruining America. Eustace, says, I got to run away from him. Right? It's this, this type of mischaracterization. And as, and as you, you know, the people who are here watching and the people who are already uh, aware of it, uh, all the information about the Federal Reserve is, is not a secret anymore. It's not a conspiracy. It's open. Right. That's why they're blowing it out the system right now, because too many people know what's up and the game's over. Right. And it's thanks to the people like Mullins and earlier Pound, who paid uh, you know the ultimate price in, in getting this information out. Right. And others, there were there were others, and I'm just focusing on the Pound Mullins genealogy right now. And by the way, this author here even uh, goes to the more recent um, legatee of um, 
of Mullins, a guy named John Kaminsky. I've read, read his work as well and uh, devotes a couple of pages to him right now. I don't think I'll have a, or maybe I should, if you'll bear with me, because we're almost at the 60 minute mark. Maybe I should uh, read a little bit from um, the Swift book before I conclude with a clip of Mullins speaking for himself, being interviewed by a pre-Alex Jones guy who was almost a dead ringer for him, by the way. I think maybe he was swapped out. Maybe let's, let's start a new rumor, right? Okay, let's read this here. Um, okay, there's one conspiracy theory. One was Overholzer, the psychiatrist, was ahead of a cabal to, to keep... Uh, uh, Ezra Pound behind bars under because he was declared mentally unfit. So he wasn't tried for treason and escaped the death penalty. So because of reasons of mental incompetence or I don't know what the official diagnosis was. And it was thanks to the psychiatrist, supposedly. But he wasn't in, still incarcerated. And it was thanks to people, by the way, like um, William Carlos Williams, who was a poet. You should know his name if you don't know his work who, by the way, himself was a medical doctor, was through his intercession and people like Robert Frost, who was big, well admired by the Kennedy liberals, right? In fact, Jackie Kennedy had him to the White House more than once. That's what the Robert interceded because he was, he might not love, like Ezra Pound personally, but he thought it was a gross injustice and helped spring him from a, uh, St. Elizabeth and Ezra Pound lived out the rest of his days and uh, Rob Hullo, um in Italy. He, he he ended his days there, you know, until 1972. So there was this conspiracy of him being a psychiatric victim of early um, psychiatric fascism, psychofascism, whatever you want to call it, Soviet style, but American style. But the second one, Conspiracy theory had to do with, quote, unquote here, quoting features a curious character named Eustace Mullins, end of quote, who stalks, well, let me continue, who stalks around the edges of the pound universe and who I came to in time to think of as re a representative sent, sent from some dark pound underground. This is the author, Daniel Swift, British defaming Eustace Mullins. But this too is part of the whole account of Pound's hospital years and shed some unexpected light upon the question of Pound's madness. In the thin pages of the visitor's list, the name Mr. Mullins appears twice. He is there. This guy did his archival work. I have to hand it to him. And he did go to St. Elizabeth's and walk the grounds and talk to some people. So this is a good piece of scholarship, but his agenda is to bury Eustace Mullins. All right. I have no problem. He's also a good literary critic. He's, he has some very perceptive comments on, on Charles Olson, his poetry, who was a fan of um, Ezra Pound, as I've already told you. Um, Pound called him the Mulligator or Useless Mullins. And the translator, Michael Reck, spotted him during the visit to the hospital. Quote, he seemed to have no spine, he wrote. He floated rather than walked. But this is perhaps unkind, as Mullins described his, his encounter with Pound as a religious conversion. The moment I entered the gloom of the insane ward, Mullins later wrote, quoting here, and I'll finish up, my former complacence vanished, never to return. I suddenly realized that a great writer had been punished by being confined in a madhouse solely for his political views. In an instant, Pound filled the ideological gap in my life. Never again would I remain silent in the face of injustice. And true to his vow, he completed this couple dozen books that you can still find on PDF if you can find them in print. So much that they're, they're really expensive used on Amazon. So if you can, if you luck out somehow, buy, buy the hard copies of it. Let me just finish this part here. This is Swift's language here. Um, and this has been confirmed. This is part of the history. 
Pound offered this young zealot. Is that loaded language or not? You know, young zealot. Pound offered this young zealot $10 a week and more valuably a purpose to go to the Library of Congress and read up on the history of American banks. When Mullins returned to the hospital and presented his findings, Pound commanded, according to Mullins, you must work on this as a detective story, end of quote. In 1952, this was even before I was born. That's how long ago it was published. In 1950, I tip, I give my propers, my proper respect, my props to Eustace Mullins. All right. In 1952, Mullins published a study of the Federal Reserve, which reads like a whodunit with a thousand footnotes, which recounts the dastardly founding of the Fed and a plot against the spirit of Jefferson and the principles of American democracy, but backed by the Rothschilds. So he's parodying him. He's talking down to, uh, to us, to we the reader who, do, who know better than this. This is British propaganda, even though he might not admit it. The book il includes as illustrations, quote, charts showing blood, marriage, and business relationships for all this evil is link linked. And Mullins demands, quoting, we will continue to be enslaved by the Babylonian debt money system, which was set up by the Federal Reserve Act in 1913 to complete our total destruction. And there's more and more I encourage you to read. Maybe I'll read um, other passages earlier. But the point is made. This is the most recent attempt to smear Eustace Mullins and, by extension, bury for good the literary as well as the intellectual, political, economic legacy left to us by Ezra Pound. But we are not going to let that happen, are we? That's why I'm giving this talk. Hopefully you've been able to absorb at least, at least some of the more salient aspects of the career of Pound. I encourage especially students to, to read his work directly and also, you know, us. We, we can go back and read it and you'll you'll be amazed on how fresh and contemporary it sounds. You know why? Because most of the, the people who are out there presenting this is conspiratainment copped all of this from Mullins, most of it. Right? There are updates and information and data and there are some genuine people. They're not the subject of today's talk, but I'm saying we have we have a legacy here that we can build on. We're not alone. We're not helpless. This is nothing new. The phenomenon is nothing new. Uh, Mullen says it goes back 5,000 years. We're, you know, Babylon, right? That should be a word that a lot of us have come across in our own independent reading and research. So before I conclude, I'm promising you a glimpse of the man himself, Eustace Mullins. Hello, I'm Bobby Lee, and this is The Bobby Lee Show. Today we have with us Eustace Mullins, a lecturer, an author, author of many books, a scholar, Washington Lee University. And today we're going to be talking about several different subjects. But this particular subject is the most important for today's political venue. And Eustace has written a book called The World Order. Now, Mr. Mullins has been working since for the last 50 years to research important questions that need to be answered in relationship of middle America to the political evolution. Eustace, tell us a little bit, if you would, how you got started in being an author. Well, I had always intended to be an author, but I had intended to write uh, novels, perhaps some poems, and uh, I had absolutely no interest in any research or any nonfiction work I didn't consider that as creative writing. So I met a poet, uh, a very bohemian person named Ezra Pound, who was then incarcerated without trial on a more or less lifetime basis. And um, he asked me to look into the banking interest, the Federal Reserve System. 
uh, at the Library of Congress there in Washington, D.C., and I did this, and I found it to be quite an interesting story, which launched me on research which continues to the present day. Now, this book, The New World Order, how does the New World Order deal with the banking interest in America and across the world? Well, you see, in studying the banking uh, system in the United States, I found it was part of an international system of banking uh, called central banks in Europe, and that the Federal Reserve System, which we had here, was simply an American version of the central banks they had in Europe. And I also found that these banks did not exist as some entity in some world of their own. They were an integral part of what I came to call the world order. Now, Eustace, <clears throat> this new world order and this banking system, I was under the impression that the banks themselves were American banks and it was the federal government that owned the banks. Are you telling me that, that our government itself doesn't own these banks? Well, our government doesn't own anything. We really don't have a government. We're just a colony of England. Hmm. How can you say that? A colony of England? Why, well, I know that they have the Republican Party and the Democrat parties, and, and I go down to the local bank and I can cash a dollar bill, can't I? Oh, well, you can go into any colony of, of Great Britain and cash a check. Uh, that doesn't mean you're in an independent nation. Would you trace for me the colony of Great Britain to the United States and the banks? If I went to, if I put a Federal Reserve note in the bank today, how can I say that that, or how could you tell me that's a part of a colony of Great Britain? Well, you see, we started out as a colony of Great Britain, and then presumably we won political independence uh, in the uh, American Revolution. But you see, uh, the American Revolution was not against the bank. The American Re uh, Revolution was against King George III. So we won against King George III, but we didn't win against uh, the Bank of England, of which King George III was a major stockholder. So King George lost this wonderful colony over here, but he retained the banking control and continued to uh, get his interest and his profits from uh, his American colony, just as before. Okay, let's go from King George to the Federal Reserve. What happened? Okay, I think that's, there's about seven parts of that really good interview that's still on YouTube, so I'd encourage you to to watch it. It's, it's listenable. I, 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 if you have children, adult children, or in school, have them watch this, because this is not something they're going to get in the uh, K through 12 or the, the college or the university curriculum it's been blotted out all the all the institutions that, that decide curriculum have been hijacked long a long long time ago and that's one of the reasons why i'm doing this talk to try to circumvent that is go around the the iron curtain that's descended upon original american organic thinkers like ezra pound and uh, eustace mullins so, so this is a, a a good start here and i think it's a it's a um a valuable um, exercise to re to revisit uh, the pioneers here because the struggle uh, that's facing us is is going to be uh, even more difficult because now that the the, the biotechnologies that they have at uh, their disposal are even more refined. Uh, on the other side, uh, the the it's just the numbers and the percentage of the not just American but the global population who now understand what was then being denigrated as conspiracy theory has never been at a higher point. I, I haven't done a poll on it. I, the people who do polls work for the banks, right? The the, the uh, Pew Pew poll, P E W, and what, whatever they they are extensions of the opinion. Um, attitude and opinion pollsters that work for the central banks. But if we ever do impressionistically a poll of the um, worldwide audience, and that's, I think, the people who are, are behind bricks and moving themselves away from the petrodollar, I think those people who theorize it and conceptualize it and are put into operation now, I think my suspicion is they were listening to Ezra Pound, they were reading his work, and they were reading the work of Eustace Mullins, and they found that that their work was solid, and that 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 was the reason why the Soviet Union was under debt slavery to the same banks, and they were worse off than than they were under uh, Tsar Nicholas, right? Both Tsars, one and two, and um, countries of, of the Middle East and in Latin America 
finally got a historical perspective thanks to thinkers like this who laid it out for them in a comprehensive historical framework. And same for, for Americans, of course. But I think the contributions here have had such a radical uh, effect on, on, on the global reawakening to, not reawakening, but awakening to consciousness of an acknowledgement and reaction to, such as the new monetary systems of exchange that are now being born while we're, while we're alive. This is a very exciting time for us, ladies and gentlemen, right? We are we are seeing the results of decades of work that were that was done, pioneering work done by people like Ezra Pound. All right. And because of our, our knowledge and our information and our friends overseas, who include the BRICS nations, the world economy is going to be okay. That's my, that's my I'm sorry. It's I'm going against all the, the fear mongers in so-called independent media. Right. That's that's how they sell gold and silver in storable foods and tasers. And that's how they they, they build their numbers. There is by, by just promoting gloom and doom and uh, catastrophism. But there is there is a new I don't think it's going to be a single single one. I think there's going to be a uh, I won't say a multitude, but but a hybrid, hybrid systems of of exchange, international exchange that are gonna replace the Rothschild Center City of London exchange that has held most of the world, uh, including the Asian world, the Chakam world, the Chinese, East Asia, right? The, the, the British East Asia company, the Dutch East Asia, I mean, they've been doing it for, for hundreds of years. That, that epoch is coming to an end because the knowledge has grown. Knowledge is our best defense against oligopoly, dictatorship, and hegemonic control over how we're going to live our lives. And the good news is that a new economic system is, is a boring. There's going to be some casualties. There's going to be some hurt. There's going to be some restructuring. I'm not saying that we're all of a sudden going to be raptured into a new peaceable kingdom of econ economic uh, equality. I'm not saying that. But the doom and gloom that's being promoted by supposedly our allies, there you're part of the problem, Jack. You're part of the problem. That's why I don't watch you anymore. That's why I stick with the books. And that's why I go old school. Because all you YouTubers and some of you on Rumblers, right, who are alternative, you're working for the other side, whether you know it or not. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's the good news for Sunday. Right, I gave you an Easter Sunday rundown on the satanic Luciferian origins of the University of California, especially Stanford University. And today I connected with the larger banking system. Right, Leland Stanford direct line connects through JP, House of Morgan, right, Kuhn Loeb, all those characters in the House of Rothschild and King George III <laughs> and uh, King Charles the second or third. I don't know what number he's on, but uh, I'm sure he's quaking in his breeches. <laughs> what am I going to do? The whole world is against me. Anyway, thank you very much again. And uh, I'll see you soon. I'm, I'm working on some, some good talks. Believe me. All right. Thank you. Bye.